information about on the website. We've also generated some potential uh, places that uh, any individual could go and, and participate in, but that might interest uh, several people to try to get a couple of friends, you know, the uh, Pilko Abroad group, go <laughs> to the Kalik Slovaka uh, um, pilgrimage um, to one of these sites. Uh, so at least for the next approximately hour, yeah, it's gotten very warm in here. It's supposed to be it's supposed to be in Massachusetts. It's warm and warm and warm. But it, it, it seems to me that it would be valuable for uh, people to uh, describe something that uh, for at least a few uh, a few minutes or a while, uh, something that uh, more than one of us could join you on or uh, several of us could join you on, keeping in mind that we're also going to talk about how we inspire each other to, to find things locally and, and what are some ways that you all have found the projects that you've been involved in locally. But for now, let's, if we can, talk about uh, people make a pitch for something you'd like to, that you'd like to do or that you'd like to see a, 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 a probably small group uh, in, involved in. in Peter and Marsha have mentioned the, the Kino border project. Is there more you'd like to say about that? Sure. I, I do have a couple of slides that I could show that it's on, the, on my laptop. Yeah. We could transfer them. Uh, let's see. Plugging your laptop into this might be a little more <laughs> challenging than uh, if, if you have them on a USB drive. I can. No, I cut because I was putting together a group and somehow it shows them individually rather than as a thing that just you have to go back and forth um, rather than I just hit the arrow that right. goes forward and back. I'll show you where it is. Yeah, um, no, I think it might be better if we, it, for the, we'd have to pause and fiddle yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Let's make sure we make that happen. Well, well, we can do it another time. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah cool. right. Okay. You might be able to explain. I can describe the, what the experience is. Yes, and yeah. want to add mm -hmm. what? Please do. Yeah. Okay. So basically, um, I described what they do at the Kino Border um, facility. Um, so I went with the group from my church in, in uh, D.C. Um, about a year ago. And basically, you fly down to Tucson, and we rented a van for the group, everybody chipping in, and then drove to Nogales, Arizona, which is right on the border. And that's where the Jesuits are, that's where they live. So they've got a group facility there with bedrooms and bathrooms and so forth. Um, so we all stayed there and had our meals there. And then um, we went across the border into Nogales, Sonora, to 
this facility that Homer built. And um, we got there early because mostly the men, but all of the migrants who had been deported get dropped off in the middle of some, uh, Nogales, Sonora. And it's sort of, now guys, make your way. So they know to come to the Comedor where there are, um, it's run by a couple of sisters and some of the Jesuits and they have volunteers. And they serve them a meal. They serve, I guess they serve three meals a day. Anybody deported can just come in there. Um, they also have a little first aid station in the facility. And so if somebody has some medical, not serious, serious medical problems, but a lot of them have been injured going across the fence and going through the desert and so forth. Um, the other thing they do is they have, they give them, uh, let them use uh, telephone cards so that they can call home or they can call their family back in the United States. And they're basically there then to talk with them about, okay, you know, what else do you want to do? And they try to help them either get back to where they're going in Mexico, increasingly Central America, but they don't help them jump the border. Um, and so basically it's that kind of place that they, once they're dumped into uh, Mexico, start to pull themselves together to figure out what they can do and they get back to um, As I said, they have a separate facility for women and actually they will, it's a shelter for women. They can be there more than just, they can sleep there, for example. Um, so what the Kino border does with these immersion programs is they say you drive down there and you spend the better part of the day uh, at the Comedor helping out. Um, and then going around and seeing the border operation on the Mexican side, including the wall that divides the city. Um, and then let me think, we, had, we went, we go back to the Arizona side to sleep. Um, and we went up to a, uh, a parish just over the border on the Arizona side. And we talked to the people there, they had like a, breakfast and we talked to them about their experiences and what they're feeling and a number of them are ranchers and it's a very interesting perspective because they are not people who are saying geez I can't wait till they build the wall here um, you know that many of them are people who will put water out for the people who are coming to the desert and of course, that puts them in some jeopardy because they're not supposed to be doing that. Um, and one guy talking about the, the drug people who sit up in the mountains and watch to see where the border patrol is. And then they send their people across the border over trafficking people. And often they will basically make the people think, oh, you just get over the border and you are in USA as you envision it, and you're not, you're in the desert. And a lot of these people, it's probably a couple of days that they're walking through the desert, which is very dangerous because they're not prepared for it. Um, well, the other thing I should say is there is a village on the Mexican side, which is a, um, part of their economy is outfitting people to come across the border. So you can buy water jugs, that are black so that they won't show up. You buy knapsacks, you buy uh, all sorts of paraphernalia, which ostensibly help you traverse the desert and go across the border. Um, but you see a lot of this stuff is just left in the desert because people have given up or in some cases have died. Um, so we went and we talked to the, uh, the people at that parish and then, um, uh, Father Neely, who is the Jesuit there, he takes you out into the desert. And so you walk in through the desert just to see what the conditions are like. And, you know, you see these places, for example, where there is, there's, there's a fair amount of brush there. It's not like the Sahara. Um, and so people walk through these pathways where they've got brush on either side. What they don't realize is that they're walking through an arroyo. And so they will sleep there 
and then there'll be a rush of water, and they will drown. Um, and that's why you end up seeing knapsacks and things like that. Um, so it's basically so that you see what the conditions are like. And then I think the next day it was, we went back up to Tucson and spent uh, half a day in uh, the immigration court. And so you see at least one kind of processing that goes on. And basically, if I recall, this was a procedure called, uh, not speed trap, but something speedy. But basically what it is, someone who gets caught the first time of entering illegally, they're basically told, if you uh, plead guilty to entering illegally, um, we will deport you, but we it won't count as a felony. Um, and uh, so these people come and you see a group of probably eight or 10 at one time, they each get an individual, individual hearing, uh, and they have some lawyer basically working them through the process. But basically they've pleaded guilty, they know they're gonna get deported, and um, I mean, it is unnerving because they are brought in in chains. Um, and so, you know, not that they're going to escape. Um, and so you see how that processing goes. And we did ask to speak to the judge afterwards, but she would come and talk to us about it, and she did. Um, and she was a, a native of Nogales, Arizona, and she talked about how, and her father was a customs agent. And she said that, uh, you know, they went back and forth as kids to play with friends across the border and everything. And now, of course, it's completely different. And so she, you know, she's really caught in that she's part of the system and she's got certain procedures and yet she can identify with the people who are being um, captured here and, and, being, and deported. Um, so there may have been some other elements, but those were the main ones. And so you, then we, you know, drove back to Tucson and, and people felt like we fine. And the whole idea, of course, is one, to make people really aware of the situations. Um, and, and two, of course, to encourage people to work for more humane policies, and three, to contribute money to Kino so that they can continue to, to do this. Um, so they, they bring a lot of church group down. I said they bring a lot of Jesuit high school kids down, and I think they also would bring you know, a group that would be of interest to, to, to doing that. But it, so you get a, I think you get a pretty good sense of it. And I mean, the thing is, you see the, the, the wall, which is the typical Trump wall with the, the metal uh, slats. slats. And um, when you're on the Mexican side, you see all of this Mexican art, it's mm. political art. Um, when I show you the slides, you can see them. Um, but there also was a picture because there was a very, Controversial well, um, incident. A young boy, Mexican boy, was on the Mexican side, throwing rocks sort of through the slats. Or, I don't know if you could even hit over because the kid was like seven <coughs> years old, ten years old, maybe. Um, and Border Patrol shot him. And so his picture is up on the wall. And of course, that's a huge issue on the, on the Mexican foot of both sides. You know. <coughs> so, um, and, and like when we were walking around in uh, Nogales, uh, Mexico, after giving people lunch and stuff, and you see the same guys who you were feeding lunch, and they're, they're basically hanging around trying to figure out what in the world they're gonna do. Oh, because they are, I get this straight, when they are deported, they are given money. They're given a card, but it's a US dollar. And so when they go into Mexico, that's it. Then they can't really use that. And so that's another thing I think that Comedor does is they help them exchange their money from dollars to pesos. What card? Some kind of I don't know what kind of card. Something that wasn't 
they couldn't really use it, at least for the kinds of things they wanted to buy in Mexico. So they had to somehow translate them. Thank you, Peter. So we could put a group together and, and see ask about a time could, yeah. we could go. And I, I'm certainly willing to ask if they could accommodate mm -hmm. such a group. And I think it's the type of thing you got to do it well in advance because they yes. will How many things were you done? Uh, we were there basically Friday through Monday, I think it was. So you got to probably get there Thursday night. And then I think people, I think I came home on Monday night. No, Tuesday morning, Thursday night. So did, did you say these are people who've been picked up for minor crimes? No, these are people who were jumping over the fence. But there were some, no, but there were also people who had been working in the United States. I mean, some of them in North Carolina, a bunch of them in Nevada, uh, had jobs, maybe for 10 years, had family, um, and they somehow got picked up. You don't know the details. Um, in the court, in the hearings, do they go through the details? No, no, no. This was talking to people in the coma who were, oh, oh. that's how you find it. No, they don't go into any of that detail. It's boom, boom, boom. Uh -huh. Is it, true, oh, I was say, is it true that crossing the border illegally is technically a misdemeanor? No. I, I, think, I think illegal entry is a felony only because they were plea bargaining. That's what basically what they were doing. But you know, they didn't have a whole lot of bargaining leverage. And these individuals weren't seeking uh, amnesty. Asylum, they weren't seeking asylum. No. I mean, they, I guess they weren't that. Sophisticated, and it would be hard. Most of them were <clears throat> men, individual men, um, and so it would be sort of hard. I mean, they basically would come in because they wanted to make money. You mentioned that the second uh, request that they make, uh, aside from I can't remember, the, well, uh, to contribute to uh, efforts to eliminate this problem. I'm just using very vague language. What specifically would they I, have in mind? We didn't get into a lot of detail with them. Okay. I mean, they, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm sure that, that they could go through what they see are the most mm -hmm. important thing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, does Kino have any other locations that they do this, for example, any place where there are kids being held? This is the only one that I know of. Father Kino was this missionary in Arizona, so that's where oh. the name comes from. Right. I'm sure there are similar things. Yeah, there is a website, and we'll, we'll link this up, called Southern Border Communities Coalition. And it has projects that you can link to in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Mexico itself. But whether any of them are involved with the kids, I just don't know. But there are some web quick education things. Uh, Peggy, did you want to say something? Yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask, ask you. you mentioned there were deportees coming from, for instance, North Carolina. U.S. government, if we're sending an American citizen back to the States because they're indigent, we only send them to the nearest port of entry. And I would have assumed that our custom and border police would have been sending the Mexican deportees again to the nearest port of entry if it was somebody from North Carolina it would have been Matamoros opposite Brownsville. Yeah, I don't know, but I did, I remember talking specifically to a guy from North Carolina. So if, if our government is sending people back to other ports of entry and giving them money, I'm, I'm frankly surprised that ICE is giving them any money. You don't know the specifics of, of his situation. No, but he had a job in North Carolina. So. Right, and where he was picked up and how he was processed. But on a lighter note, <laughs> if you wanted to go and extend your stay in Dallas and you needed dental work, you would have your choice of dental <laughs> In Nogales, Mexico. In Nogales, Mexico. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> and it's one dental clinic after another. So it's one, one of the ways in which Mexican development is prospering. Yeah. So yeah. many Americans immigrate to Mexico to retire and <laughs> have medical work done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, no, it's dental tourism. U.S. dollars are flowing in there. So, so I uh, wondered if, in a similar presentation, if you, Karen, or, or, or you, Peggy, would want to describe in any more detail. You had mentioned, Karen, the, the uh, Tijuana Initiative and um, 
maybe one or two others. Do you see? And Jen, could you name that umbrella organization? Oh, yes, it's called the, the uh, uh, S B like boy C C Southern Border Communities Coalition. Um, uh, I have six or seven um, links to to, to post, um, but this was the one that did a nice job collecting five or six organizations in each of those states and the country of Mexico that you can click on, like Pino was listed there, and get more information. But if, if either of you would wanted to talk more about you do your your La Asuncion I'm going to stay project focused and, on my village. Yeah, and what if there's something you see that we might do with that? And Karen, uh, go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, Sister Norma Pimentel, P I M E N T E L. She's part of CAP, or she might even be the head of CAP of Charities in the Rio Grande Valley. And they call it a respite center in the, at the McAllen bus station in McAllen, Texas. The humanitarian respite, respite center, and um, <coughs> they just people who have crossed the border um, come there, and basically they get food and shelter for a short <coughs> period of time. And people come from all over the United States, as I said, to help out um, and feeding them in the town. I happen to have an article on, on that that was in my one of my alumni magazines on her and somebody who went down and put it on the website or I'm not sure Sandy where where it's going but the same person and the same um, organization and the other was Father Ruskin R U S K I N Piedra P I E G R A and um, this is the Juan Newman uh, center in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, and he's the priest who is working with um, people taking them to court. And actually, he's not a lawyer, but he says he can speak to some people. So, kind of a, an agreement to make. Just very quickly, I, I mentioned to some of you my former uh, Peace Corps buddy, he's still my buddy. We're not in the Peace Corps anymore. Uh, has an entire career in Boston uh, in immigration law, and he works in the direction that we would be proud of. Now retired, uh, leaving for Tijuana today, uh, and he's working for a, a project called Al Otro Lado, uh, and it's supposedly a binational direct legal services organization. I'm reading, serving indigent deportees, migrants, and refugees in Tijuana. I don't know. If anyone else is aware or if this, no, okay, we can toss that into the pot. Yeah. I just learned about yeah. it today. Yeah. I've got three here in Texas. Um, Raisi, Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services. Um, they focus on providing free and low cost legal services to underserved immigrant children, families, and refugees in Central and South Texas. They've got about 50 lawyers on staff. And um, there was a Facebook fundraiser that raised over $10 million, mm -hmm. instigated by a couple. Um, and Raises does other things too. They also have volunteers. Um, then there's the Texas Civil Rights Project, helps families at the US border get legal advice and translation services. Uh, and helps them get reunited as quickly as possible. There's, as you said, there are so many. And there's the Florence Project. If you just Google helping families at the border, you get a million things. The Florence Project is also a legal aid organization in Arizona. Um, it says as 86% of those detained have no legal representation while well, going through immigration removal proceedings. So um, these people also accept volunteers as well as donations. You can help as a translator, researcher, or a pro bono attorney. Um, it just keeps going and going. And there, there's the no more deaths. Somebody yeah, yeah. put that up. Yeah. Somebody yeah, that's mentioning that one. Water. 
Yeah. And links, and links to more and more. Um, but we were talking about the, the local. Then there's the whole network of the local things that, that are that door. And, and anything anyone has done that you you'd like to do again and involve some of us, you know, take a minute to describe that. I, before I ask you, Peggy, to describe how you, if you see a way that we might assist you in your association, <coughs> make sure people knew that Mark Peterson has joined us. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> maybe you could introduce yourself and, and your wife. I, I really to my wife and Tira. Welcome, Tira. Yeah. No. A long introduction. After <laughs> after Emory's, I went to physics graduate school. I taught physics all my life, and I lived here in the seventies. So we have one brother. And you worked in which uh, uh, village? Oh, La Ascension. La Ascension. Same as Woody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, well, welcome. And you're at Mount Holyoke now. Yes, that's right. And yeah, like both uh, ended up on the faculty of Mount Holyoke. Coming from Queens. <laughs> well, congratulations on finally graduating. <laughs> it's about time, but your parents are so happy. <laughs> so please jump in, in any of the either of you in, in this discussion. So, so Peggy. Okay. Yeah, having been back to lessons from last year, this is a souvenir I picked up. It's a festival to say farewell to the monarch bus butterflies. Mm -hmm. And I brought it because it's a perfect <laughs> illustration about what La Cincion is already doing. <coughs> Having festivals, promoting people to come in on the weekends, stay there, eat there, enjoy the festival. I think they have an avocado festival. I think they have a mushroom festival. This is just one of a number. And way down at the bottom, it, it lists all the various different things that you can do. Trekking y mucho más. So I'm, I'm really keen on getting them to expand this idea of making La Asuncion, and by the way, the, the civil name is Donato Guerra, making that town a destination for muscle-powered sports that do not pollute the air, make a lot of noise, running, bicycling, horseback riding. I've come up with a list of suggestions to them, some of which would cost the government practically nothing. Like developing a network of footpaths and signposting them and having maps to give out to people who want to come out and just go hiking for the weekend or hiking for the day. Uh, the, a couple bigger cost items, one I won't even mention. But Mark, do you remember Don Arturo's house where we used to go for movies on Monday nights? Oh, I had totally forgotten. Well, <laughs> he had this magnificent old colonial house right across the street from the church. That house has completely fallen into disrepair. Nobody's living in it. I would like to suggest if we could start a seed fund to rebuild that house as a youth hostel, part of Hosteling International, it would be yet another thing that would bring young people who want to come and use their muscles out there to the village because they have a guaranteed place to stay. I think it would take a substantial amount of money to bring it up, but it's an idea. Yeah, it's a form of ecotourism. Yeah. And they're they're already embarking on it. They can probably use some more pointers and tips and encouragement, and that's what I'm here to do. I want to raise a quick question because there's uh, as we saw with the uh, mountaineers and the ambulance. And is Kevin uh, headed back or? No. Just, oh, great. Just okay. Seat, so there. No. Uh, <laughs> you change seats. Fantastic. Um, your yearly trip to Oaxaca, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think many of us are kind of, those who don't know, are stuck in the awareness that, oh, you cannot go to Mexico. No. They're mm -hmm. so dangerous. You know, the news, the image. Oh. Uh, so I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts. Yeah, not true in the western part of the state of Mexico. Right. There, there are places, I think, further north, there's certainly along the northwest, there's a lot of, that's cartel territory. I feel, you know, I haven't been there in years and years, but I think 
Mexico City is much safer now than it was in the 90s um, when, you know, there's a rash of kidnappings and taxi drivers picking people up and taking them to the ATM to uh, empty their bank accounts. But uh, a series of presidents in Mexico City, or mayors, I should say, the current president is a former mayor, um, have really done a lot somehow, I, I don't ask me quite how, to improve policing, for one, to improve air quality, for two, they've banned cars on certain days in the center and it's only oh, bikes. In Mexico yeah. City on Sundays, yeah. Reforma is no traffic, so bicyclists can only use it bikes. exclusively. It is so cool to see thousands and thousands of Mexicans out there on their bicycles. So Mexico City, I think, is you know, you always have to be careful in any big city, yes. any big city here as well. And, and, but I think that it's relatively safe. Uh, Southern Mexico, I think, is relatively safe if you're not an indigenous person, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Wow. They don't have it so easy. Um, but, you know, I, so I think there are large parts of Mexico that are very welcoming, and I've never felt any, any threat. Ditto. And you can always check the State Department's website for safety alerts. They'll tell you exactly where in Mexico you want to avoid. I was thinking that as a, as a project of people who are interested in the relations between the two countries, and we're going down the list and brainstorming what we can do. One of them is to dispel uh, the widely disseminated, I guess, myth that you step the foot over the border and the bullets start whizzing over your head. And uh, you know, hearing these narratives is so reaffirming. And then hearing what's happening from those who have stayed in touch with their villages is another form of affirmation that we can broadcast that mm -hmm. part of the world, at least, is still sane mm -hmm. and, and welcome. Yeah. Isn't there a fairly large um, winter um, American population in Oaxaca? There is. It's not as big as San Miguel Allende, which um, is a whole the whole in Navaca, which is a great retirement Navaca. destination. But there's quite Still. a few expats yeah. in Oaxaca as well. Um, any other sort of international or or out of out of our locale uh, projects that England would like to describe that they've done or are thinking about doing or have learned about and, and we'll do those and, and then move on to the, the local things that people are aware of and uh, have participated in. Yeah, I think mean, just that I, I think I mentioned this a couple of years ago, or you know, Amherst College has a student organization called Project Salud, one word, project, and then FLS, Salud. And the group has established a partnership with a clinic, community health clinic, in, uh, Barrio, right outside of Lima, Peru. And the students um, during the year, during the afternoon, do meet and we discuss various issues related to Latin America, including um, Central America and Mexico to some extent. And then three students every year go down to, uh, to this clinic and live with a family and help out. Uh, with, with some, any kind of assistance that the clinic needs. So it's kind of kind of like the Amigos in some way, in the sense that the group meets during the year and then has a, a program in the summer. And there's a lot of focus on respecting and honoring the, the culture and the community and not going down there as, uh, you know, to change them, or, you know, to, to learn. So, I mean, if anyone wants to, um, I don't know, at some point be a resource to this group in some kind of way, I, I you know, certainly welcome that. When they meet before the three go down, but the larger group, do you have guests or could, could people yeah, sit in? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That it yeah. might be a good thing to have a meeting in which, you know, a couple of meetings where um one of you or two of you could come and talk with them about their your own experiences and what you're finding now 
we got the eliminated to, to the group. Wow. So if anyone's interested, uh, let me know. Yeah, good. Well, Mark is volunteering because it's only a two mile drive. What I have in Um, but if, if it does seem to me that there is a that having the three students who came two years ago was interesting for us, and I don't know if it had an impact on them, but it was it was interesting to hear from them and their sense of what they were doing and about to do. Oh yeah, I heard from them afterwards uh, the following year, and they said they were quite affected by the fact that. You know, you all had come back together mm -hmm. after all that time, and it was still they they were quite affected by that. They, they were definitely e easy for me to say. Win. <laughs> easy for me to say because uh, I'm uh, if, you know in Sacramento and not here, but but I can see coming two times maybe once just listening and and if I live nearby and. And then come back and maybe make a, a short presentation on what we did and what our conversations about it have been later. And well, it wouldn't have to be in person. I mean, this oh, that's Skype true. or uh, yeah. whatever. There's yeah. Kind of, there's <laughs> the IT here can handle that. Yeah, sure they can. <laughs> um, so thank you. So that's another one. Um, so at at this point, are there any of you who would like to describe a, a local effort? Maybe you've mentioned it already and want to describe it in a little more detail with the with the, the thought that this is something that might inspire one or two of us to, to do something or find out about something similar locally. Um, fortuitously, a couple months ago, I was with a, a brother-in-law of mine who's in Iowa and his Unitarian Church has been the driving force in Davenport, or one of the driving forces for Davenport to be, first of all, a, 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 a city council adopted a, a, a sanctuary city initiative that this church and maybe some others brought to them. And then secondly, they have generated a list of projects similar to the, the you Kino know, Border Initiative that they can uh, volunteer in or send money to. And, and third, they've invited guest speakers from uh, probably not the, the, the Quad Cities community, but Chicago or other places to, uh, to come and talk about legal affairs as a, as a community education uh, project. And my guess is that Sacramento has a couple of churches doing something similar that I should find out about. But how did you, any of you, get into something like that, or start it, uh, or or know about uh, a network that we should be part of? Yes, please, uh, Paula, and then and, and, and then Kevin. Yeah, the Boston area has several important things. Um, one is um, statewide group, but I think it also has a presence nationally. It's called Mira Migrants. No, Massachusetts Immigrant Rights Action, I think is what the acronym stands for. It may be something else, maybe association. Um, but they do a lot of counseling to undocumented uh, immigrants and have resources, legal and, and other resources for them. Uh, but they also do a lot of advocacy at the Massachusetts State House, and they've got at least five different pieces of legislation, including the Safe Communities Act, which would largely make Massachusetts a safe sanctuary state, something like that. Uh, they're advocating for uh, driver's licenses for undocumented uh, people. They're uh, trying to get more money for English language teaching for adults uh, and higher education money and safe tuition for undocumented students. So they've got a rash of legislative proposals, which are very hard to get through the Massachusetts. The Senate is fairly good on this, but this, the House is fairly difficult. So we've been organizing out of my neighborhood group calls to people we know in some of the more conservative districts in the state for them to call their state House representative to get 
the, the one the state communities act out of committee hearing it it was introduced last year and it died in last year's session so there's a whole advocacy and that's not asking much of anybody it's just asking for maybe a phone call and then a follow-up phone call to say to their rep what about this are you a supporter are you co-sponsored you get enough you can get it through so i know that's on the more advocacy level out of boston but there's also and katie and i were talking about it the boston immigrant justice action network who do a lot of um, more the social services end of things, accompany people to deportation hearings, uh, have vigil, candlelight vigils outside of um, local jails where people are being held, uh, help with transportation, medical needs. Uh, they have a telephone line. I'm not quite sure how it works, but a lot of people detained face exorbitant costs. It's profit making to have a telephone call from a jail or prison, you know, there's, there's tremendous amounts of money made off of prisoners trying to communicate with their families. So um, Bijan, it's called, or Bijan, um, organizes a hotline for anybody that wants to call in or call out, and they're able, and don't ask me quite how they do it, but to, to bypass that profit-making telephone system and then be able to, through a, you know, triangulate a uh, phone service with the family member or the lawyer or, or usually lawyers can get through without that help but you know can help with that communication because detained people you know really are without much communication at all mm -hmm. um, so that that those are a couple of organizations in the boston area that are fairly active um that may have Similar. Yeah, very. Yeah, and there's, there's a host cities. of others, but mm -hmm. those are just yeah. a couple of examples. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure New York City probably has a lot of similar organizations. I'm not, I don't know the names of them, but I do know of someone um, who volunteers for an organization where they, they do go to court with people and they, they just sit with them. They just, you know, they're not doing anything for them except to just be with them. You know, just have somebody there to support. Support. Them. support. Exactly. So, yeah, probably other local communities have similar types of things and similar to what Kevin is describing. Yes, Kate. There's another. Um, again, probably everybody has these things, um, but there's a network called the Refugee Immigration Ministry, and they under that umbrella there town clusters. So Cambridge is clustered with Arlington and Somerville. Um, there are, and in that case, it's under the Unitarian Universalist Church. Okay. Right order. Um, there's supporting 18 or 19 refugees, immigrants right now who are going through the, the process. So it can be any, you can sign up to help in so many ways. You can host them in your home, or you can help with transportation to appointments or wherever they need to go. Help them just get a to go to the, find the grocery store, um, get used to the bus system, of course, donate money, um, building English skills, assisting with job searches, job training, coordinating a fundraising event, a grant, um, be a friend, um, and it's pretty much what, from small to huge uh, efforts that you can sign up for in this organization. And it's not a requirement to be a, a really a person of faith. It's, it's kind of a neutral, <coughs> even though it's, it's this group comes out of the Unitarian Universalist Church. I don't think you have to have faith to be a Unitarian. So they came to the sanctuary city and yeah. um, different organizations <coughs> vote to be a sanctuary yeah. church. So the Baptist church down the street from me is has become a sanctuary church and they had a family living there who 
the kids could go to school because they were going here, but the mom had to stay there because if she started walking around, she could be picked up. And there you could be trained in how to, so there were always going to be two volunteers accompanying this woman who were trained in how to speak to the police and ICE if they came in. Um, you just once you start asking around, you mm -hmm. find out all oh, this is going on. There was another Cambridge church that had people living in the basement. And that was the refugee immigration. Well, the refugee immigration, R I M, refugee ministry, yes. which when you go online, then you see these different local clusters and some of the details are going to be different in each one, but just trying to keep, oh, and there's a hashtag melt ice. <laughs> so if you go there, you'll get a bunch of links to different actions. And Act Blue is, as far as financial donating, Act Blue is an umbrella for a lot of these small organizations. I think I've given to keep families together through under Act Blue. Um, so it's a 501c3 and it, it uh, I forget, a conduit for contributions to a lot of small things. So all out there. Um, uh, uh, any other local initiatives? Yeah. Um, Health care for children of um, illegal immigrants. Actually, in some states, Massachusetts and New York, according to the federal law, um, those kids are covered by Medicaid. And there was a bill before the Connecticut State Legislature um, to uh, provide coverage for uh, Medicaid and Husky B, which is the state. Um, and it looked to some of these kids, I think, that health care for some of these uh, youngsters could be a, another project. Mm -hmm. in, Legislate, legislatively pushing it through or helping. Thank you. I think in every community, again, I work in a locality like in County of Virginia, every community has a raft of organizations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are, you know, homeless shelters, legal aid, etc., of which an enormous proportion are either needing language translation, make the undocumented, free clinics, you know. Any community has a raft of it, and if you have a diverse community, which most cities are somewhat diverse, chances are they're helping a lot of refugee, undocumented, legal or not legal, in any number of ways. So if you have an interest in healthcare, for example, there's probably a free clinic. If you have an interest, in, I know we had a Northern Virginia Family Service that did mental, bicultural, bilingual mental health conferences. I mean, they all have to respond to people in need. So they're all working like hell in order to address those needs. So any community of any diversity will have a raft of those things. Marcy, can I follow up on that? Because I, I came here with different, not with the focus on immigration, but on education and, and doing something back with the communities. I'm, I'm stumped to find, and I wish I'd done this before, the, crown fun, the crowdfunding uh, projects in Mexico, We're doing something in some of the villages that, that would support the needs that are generated locally um, uh, in these communities, rather than trying to, to guess what quote the, the needs are. But I'm more interested in something that's education oriented. And, and I go back to, are we treating, are we focusing on symptoms? Are we trying to address the root of the problems? And what I liked about the video was the, the focus on the, I mean, somebody's saying there's a need for improved educational opportunities. Um, and something I read about so many kids just don't even finish the sixth grade. Um, I'm not sure how to quote, address the root of the problems, but I would love to see some sort of dialogue going on with someone in some of these different communities. Well, uh, in addition to, to Peggy staying in touch with Asuncion, are any of us, um, or are we aware of any of the Amiga group who aren't here who have stayed in connection with any of those six towns we were in? Um, 
Mm -hmm. I've stayed in touch with people from those towns, from Hiki. They're all in Mexico and Toluca. They've left. Well, some of the family is still there. What's the town like? I just was curious what the town is like. Now you went back, right? Yeah, well, I have, I can show you some slides. Um, completely, completely different. I mean, paved roads, Better? Yeah. traffic jams. <laughs> uh, there's a. Uh, yeah. What? There's franchise school. No, no, no franchise school. Uh, no McDonald's? There was a jujitsu. <laughs> a jujitsu. <laughs> <school. laughs> yeah. And why are people leaving? For jobs? Or? Yeah. Like, I mean, a lot of them. I mean, the ones, for, for example, Pepe and Rosario and Maria Elena, they left as young people. Mm -hmm. You know, they got a job. In, that's Sanborns in Mexico City or something like that. But I mean, there obviously are a lot more jobs there, commercial jobs. La Asuncion may be kind of unique in that back after World War II, one of the primary families made the commitment to send all of their sons and their oldest daughter to Toluca for secundaria preparatoria and university. Yeah. And the daughter, Maria Elena Mendieta, came back and was principal of the elementary school from 1960, seven years before we got there. She didn't retire until 2014. Oh my goodness. And that the other families in the village watched this example and realized how important education was, made the commitment to send mostly their sons, but also some daughters out. And that nucleus of young people who got professional education and got good jobs all over the Republic they retained and became a sort of a booster club for the town. And they would go back and talk with the town fathers. They had a prioritized list of development projects to carry out. And the professionals would raise the money from their own salaries to go to the state government and say, we've raised X million pesos. We, our next project is get our road paved. Remember how bad the access road was, oh, Mark? Yeah. The state government was glad to partner with them, and that village has just prospered because of this strategy of raising money locally as seed money and then getting the state government to come back in and invest more money into the town. And that's why the town has prospered so well. And that was the education. Yeah. Well, to, to Roger's question about are there ways we can connect with it? With education programs and to root causes, um, it, is 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 that something you think we might be able to do with a couple of of other towns besides La Asuncion that might require a, a, a visit from a couple of us uh, tomorrow? We're going to talk about organizing a trip. Um, that's a potential purpose. Are there other ways? And and would would not necessarily have to be any of our six villages, although that would sense if we could do something with Mr. Philco or uh, big stop on the other which are little self self-contained places. Calix the Waka is a little more like a Toluca suburb. I don't know how easy it would be to open something there. Maybe it would be easier because it's so close to Could we see the photos of Iki Pilco? <coughs> are there before and after photos? Yeah. Oh great. It's, it's hard to, we're actually recording this uh, to put on the website. So the focus is on what you're saying right and now. contributing right now. What I thought Peter and I might do is when we finish, um, look at what he's got and see if I can transfer yeah. it here so that it can be projected up there. If that doesn't happen today, We'll make sure that it gets on the website in the near future. And, and it could be shown when we're not recording the discussion, yeah. just for yeah. us at yeah. the break or something too. Katie or Marcia? I was thinking of answering Roger's, your question. No, go ahead. Yeah, then if we can figure it out. Just a simplistic, a really simple thing. The government builds our schools. We can't probably build schools in the town. So two things, we could buy computers if they don't have computers 
And if the, why do the kids drop out? Maybe there's some sort of scholarships that could be given, but it's sort of a stumper. How do you intervene in their education? Well, I hesitate us deciding what a new cause is and going in and trying to solve it. I would more partner with a local group that has built a history, maybe yeah. some infrastructure, whatever. Um, I, but I really hesitate for us to decide what the new causes are for any case. Yes, I would too, but the crowdfunding stuff is uh, locally generated. Okay, so they would not then so not, utilize a crowdfunding well, that comes from a local. Here, not, I be careful Spanish too because there are a lot of there are a number of teachers just like in the U.S. who say they do not have money for certain. Okay. Uh, I think you should, should be careful. So, There's a lot of fraudulent funding. You know, a lot of <laughs> half-baked ones that go apart and don't mm -hmm. spend the money on what they say they yeah. will. So mm -hmm. using a reputable, mm -hmm. firm, solid local source. That is doing something that we can see works. However, you see works. I'm wondering if it might be useful to have some of the what's the name of the town? The one that we have a number of volunteers who Hiki Hiki Pilko. Have some of those people go back to Hiki Pilko, get to find out who who's the head of the elementary school? Do they have a PTA? And ask them what their needs might be in order to get more kids locally educated mm -hmm. further. And Karen. Just, just in terms of the um, involvement of the government, what we discovered in Codex of Walk, and I have reason to believe it's still the, the same, is that the um, indigenous villages were being just omitted from a lot of the social service that they were completely entitled to. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in our village, um, we had a group of advisors from the community, and they said, we really need the water to come into this village in more places than it does in one town. And um, we were able to go to Sulubidad, talk to them, and it turned out, and we went together with the community, um, and it turned out that they were completely entitled to that. They were completely entitled to a lot of services, including <coughs> bus service for the secondary school, and once they realized that, they were able to, to take and go involved with that. And we did, in fact, when we were there, watch that happen. Secondary mm -hmm. school kids went to secondary school, um, and water came into all parts of the village. Mm -hmm. And a lot of washing stuff. Uh, for some reason, they built them so tall that they were too tall for me, but they put in a lot of washing stations for clothes washing so you can have use the river and pollute the river. But anyway, I, I, that's just. Community organizing 101. Yeah, you know, and I think that's what you're talking about. So we, yeah. we spray painted on those Baron walls. Yeah. Take that, Ivan Illich. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at any rate, I, I mean, that's certainly a possibility to go to the villages and find out. I mean, it's a different Mexico, as Bill has said. Yeah. And, you know, without going to the villages and finding out who's running the show there yeah, and what yeah. it's like. There's really no way to answer any of these questions about whether we repeat what you've done. I mean, none of us have been on the other back, but not in the recent time. Um, I'd like. You're the only one who has. Sorry, did you? I didn't. I'm finished. Don't worry. Okay, sorry. Anyway, I don't mind being drugged. I'm a lawyer. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we heard about that. The whole thing about being interrupted. Go right there. No. <laughs> I want to talk about education because that was the theme in my Peace Corps experience in northeastern Brazil, we were going to emulate Head Start programs. And it was an excellent idea for the same reasons we've been talking about here. Uh, kids wouldn't get to the end. They would be more useful in the field than they would be inside a schoolhouse. And so we had just derived this wonderful uh, model, Lyndon Johnson, uh, so that you could educate people about school before they got there then it would make sense and then it would be exciting rather than an alienating experience. And we worked with the Secretary of Education of the state of Sergipe, about the size of Rhode Island, not as big as other states in Brazil. And we ran against all kinds of problems. I mean, it was, uh, oh yes, let's do it. A lot of lip service, but when uh, the, uh, the rubber had to hit the road, it, it, was, it was problematic. So if you're imposing a view on top of a, an existing structure, there has to be some easy way to align 
Um, on the other hand, the power of, of crowdfunding is, is such a temptation. Uh, and I started thinking, okay, well, maybe you can't transform. Uh, I remember the teachers in Palpasco, we used to deal with them, do a little work in their classrooms. Uh, and, and I wouldn't think that any of them was a viable agent of change. It just wasn't that way. I mean, in other places it could be. I mean, some of the Padres were amazing, right? But uh, to, to launch that kind of thing, would it be more profitable to think in terms of a scholarship that you could actually affect the educational potential of uh, one of the residents of, of the villages that we were in and, and help and, and really transform the life of someone, would that be more within our grasp? Would that be a more valuable initiative to take? So I looked at where we are in the station in our life and uh, uh, the amount of time and resources we might have to bring to bear. Um, and I, I can only agree that education is where it starts and ends. You can, unless you radically uh, realign the educational system in terms of a progressive society, excuse me for showing my politics a little, um, you really haven't uh, uh, made a dent in the problem. And that is a root thing and can only do well. But what can we do with what we've got? That's that's right. So if we uh, uh, if, if we if we talk tomorrow about a trip, that certainly could be an objective of, of, of a visit to at least a couple of the, the six villages mm -hmm. of making those kind of contacts to make that kind of decision. Karen. Yeah, you know, um, Buddha Judge said the other day that he thought there should be mandatory service mm -hmm. like there used to be when kids had to do something you know, the military they go into the peace corps they could go into whatever whatever and i thought to myself god that's such a, a what you know it, it's like a flash from the past i mean mm -hmm. that, obviously we all thought that that was what you did in life but <coughs> how do we have to re-educate this entire society having been through the trauma of trump to understand that this is a very beneficial thing for our younger population and a very beneficial thing across the board, this kind of interconnectedness that you establish with another country or within your own country. So maybe, and I know this is a bit of a crazy idea, but I like it. Maybe we could go back to some of the villages on your model and go back and meet with the people who are running the villages today and explain what's happening in your village and how much we benefited you know so much that we want to see if there's any anything we could do you know any way we could interface again with this village and tape it and write a book about it so that there's something out there to show that there are these wonderful experiences people have had in mexico so stop being afraid of mexico and, mm. and that there's an absolute necessity for young people to somehow connect in a way that makes them understand this interconnectedness um, because it's so beneficial for the rest of their lives. Here we are 50 years later, the only explanation for us continuing to look at this is because of the, the benefit to, to us mm. as people, as human beings. And maybe the country needs a re-education of what it means to be a human being. And a citizen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I was just talking about this to, to you know, to, 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 to go to Mark. The, really, uh, the, uh, you might say that uh, Mexico, two things. First of all, Mexico uh, in, in the general American uh, understanding is, is, is double, it's a paradox. It's a friend, it's the amigo country, and it's an enemy at the same time. For whom is it profitable and you know, uh, useful to have this double vision, uh, politically and socially, what's going on? The second thing, of course, is the business of, of service, which I was speaking about. The, um, the end of the draft in 1973, as the Vietnam War was collapsing, and Nixon no longer needed it, in a sense changed things. It got everybody off the hook, not mm -hmm. just the young men who might be drafted, but every man and woman in society in general to have any kind of uh, conscientious or sentimental uh, investment in what the United States does militarily. It became a blank check and didn't end militarism, it facilitated it. 
To reintroduce it, on the other hand, we need, we'd either need a massive war to reinstate conscription and bring back those uh, options, one O conscience objector, and even my old option which no longer exists, one AO, or we need a political support for something that most of our fellow citizens would say is communism, socialism, and big government, or whatever you want to say. How can you do this? How can you say that every young man and woman should, is, is obliged to declare herself or himself in terms of what the how they'll serve the country? I don't think it's going to fly. I'm sorry. Well, mandate maybe not, but AmeriCorps exists now. Yeah. And that's the <laughs> but, but see, all this stuff is voluntary. And that's what's wrong. Well, so it's armed forces. Exactly, exactly. The, the voluntariness of the armed forces has been a boom to the defense industry, to the war, excuse me, the war industry. I can't myself. Yeah. It's been a boom to the war industry. And for people who aren't in the defense industry, or aren't soldiers, men and women, they have, the rest of society, they've gotten a, a, a free pass. They have no inclination of, for a, a conscientious opinion about anything the United States does militarily. They can support, oppose, or ignore. And we're all, everyone is off the hook, and it's not good. Its consequences are actually, some of the consequences are negative. It's a double-edged sword. I'm happy that my, my young, the young man I taught when, until I retired didn't have to think about it. I'm delighted they didn't think about it. But then I thought, well, the other side of the coin is men and women, they don't know, who, for better or for worse, volunteer, are getting chewed up in Afghanistan and elsewhere and all over the world. And uh, our fellow citizens, once again, have a, at least a three-pronged option, support, oppose, or ignore. Is that good? I don't know. It's <clears throat> Sorry. I'm, I'm no, no, it's, 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 it's very hard to Yeah, that's okay. Well, that's that's part of the reason why many of the young people uh, volunteer and sign up because of, for economic reasons. Because I spoke to a young man who wanted to go into the Air Force, and I said, the volunteer, I said, it's great. We'll get three meals, we'll get some training, it'll be even interesting. And maybe there won't even be a war. So, <laughs> so I, w I wouldn't oppose a man or a woman volunteering to go into the service. I would just tell them what they're in for. It's boring. I was in it. <laughs> and and yet it doesn't change anything, you see. But the no the, so the notion of, of, of mandating some sort of service is, is an idea that comes and goes, and certainly one that can support it if there are opportunities for it. Um, I don't know if we want to slightly change the subject, but I was wondering if people thought it would be valuable to have a uh, I've forgotten the the what sociologists call it, but a sort of inventory of our of our skills and um, uh, uh, experiences. So, how how many of the 55 people we have we can contact uh, who were in these projects in the 60s? How many of, of you all are fluent in Spanish? Uh, how how many of you all have uh, uh, economics uh, or education or Etc. Backgrounds, or is there a use for, um, for that? An inventory. I second plus. that. It's a very valuable sure. tool, um, and it also unites. Uh, I, there's a lawyer here, <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one, and you're actually sitting next to each other, uh, and, and that's fantastic. They're interrupting each other. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. the bad part. It's only bad thing about lawyers. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, but languages. Uh, Basically, a resource chart would be a tremendous uh, way to yeah. further categorize our, our capabilities as a group. Mm -hmm. One other thought just jumped into mind. We, we talked about the demise of CIASP and Ivan Ilyich and CDOT and all of those efforts that were, I think, crucial to us and part of the idealism of the 60s. So, survived here today, so good. But... Um, is there any role that we can play with the organizations that educated us? Sorry, Newton College of the State. <laughs> <Right. Park. laughs> it, it was a great well, school. Boston College. Yeah, BC. Boston, yeah. yeah. It infiltrated Boston uh, <laughs> Again, tossing it out. Um, is there any way that 
uh, we can look into those organizations and see if there's any way that our experience could be of use. Sounds rather vague, but are, are, are there any uh, student-led groups that are doing things? So I see it initially as a research project. You know, what's happening at Yale? What's happening at Brown? What's happening at Amherst? You know. uh, well, if, if the president of Amherst were to come in right now for a few minutes, what would we want to tell her? Is, are, or is that another way to frame the question? Is there something we can do as alums that we would want to tell them, Albertus and Brown and Williams and Amherst? First of all, I think yeah. we should educate ourselves and see what they are doing. Because they're doing amazing things. I mean, yeah. before we open our mouths, I think mm -hmm. we should be a little yeah. educated or yeah. self -known. No, that's what I said, yeah. research. Yeah. Yeah. I can comment on Smith having just been there. Uh -huh. When I arrived at Smith, our class had, I think, three people of color in it. Now you look at the class that's just graduating 2019 and the class that graduated 10 years before and 10 years before, and each year there have been more people of color, many different colors, many different nationalities, so that Smith nowadays doesn't just look like the population of America, it looks like the population of the world. And there are a large number of young women coming to Smith from other countries, which is very great. And I, I have a feeling there's probably a core group of Latinas who might be worth reach, reaching out to. Yeah. I think course, you're, yeah. 50 years ago, Amherst was 1,200 male students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I think it's 60, now we split 50-50, so the world has changed. Yeah. And I think 50 years ago, Amherst had the moratoriums, and if you remember, one of the demands was to have women, have, have women, right? <laughs> it happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's small, it's small. Yes, although there are an amazing number of people marching in those parades who you cannot tell whether they're men or women, <laughs> whether they're gay or transitioning or just what. <laughs> I had my 50th a couple years ago and I was just fascinated because I thought I could usually tell. Yeah, I could yeah. not tell and I was guilty of staring too. I was <laughs> frustrated that I couldn't come to any conclusion. It's eye popping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's a whole lot of <clears throat> transitioning going on mm -hmm. in our society. Suddenly I know people, all, one of the teachers where I work is, um, her little boy is now a girl and he's, she's six, which she knew. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really interesting. Yeah. So the world is changing. When, when I read the stuff that comes from Smith, they're very sophisticated. They are so many levels beyond the thinking that we did. It's all terminology that I'm panting to keep up with and very specific and maybe they're not, um, maybe it's a lot of book learning and fancy words, but I don't think it all is. I think they are really further along than we were, that's for sure. Can I ask a question? Maybe just put it in 10 more minutes to yeah. And maybe this is it. Are we just looking I mean, a lot of these are good causes all of us individually mm -hmm. do, and we can do more of it, et cetera. But I thought the question is, and I hadn't decided in my mind, we're looking for a group one. So are we talking about something that we can do as individuals just to multiply it by 50? Or are we talking about something that a group only can do? It's not that we can all contribute to, to mm -hmm. our college's diversity. I give to the Asian American Scholarship that Brown. So, I mean, I can continue to do that, but it seems to me what we're looking for is something that the dynamic of a group makes different than what we can all do individually and do do individually. So the, that's why I was searching. What are we talking about? Yeah, but, well, we're, we're, <laughs> in my head, at least, I'm we're, I'm thinking about more than one 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 thing, and that to the extent we can come up with activities that we can do as a group um, that, 
that will we'll have some synergy among ourselves. Vis-a-vis -vis our colleges, it seems to me that finding out what each of our colleges does in this realm of international exchange or uh, and immigration issues and anything else we would want to put within that are our you know are they doing anything? Can we participate in some of that? Can we inform some of that? Is a kind of group project. Even if the even if what Albertus is doing is quite different from what Amherst is doing, which may not be a long list of things, but but it does seem to me that there's some potential for us to exchange ideas and and and, and findings. And I'm not sure what we what we do vis-a-vis -vis our colleges, but um, and starting with Katie's, well, what are they doing now? Uh, does seem and to a lot of colleges are doing a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm mm -hmm. not sure they're even doing the full research. I mean, I just know a little bit about what they're doing, but they're doing things about gender, they're doing something yeah. about uh, diversity of classes, they're doing something about scholarships, they're converting <laughs> loans to scholarships rather than increasing yeah. loan. They're, they're doing a number of things, so I'm not sure what inventory. Well, is, 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 oh, isn't our context, you know, isn't our context in essence Mexico? Mexican-U.S. relations and the, the what, what we do vis-a-vis -vis our, our nearest neighbor with the, with the with the gloss, unfortunately, of our current administration writing to the White House the notion that Mexico is a problem. Which is why I thought and we spent a lot yes. of time on, on the direct issues of immigration yes. from across the southern border. I tend to think that we'd get lost in that kind of research and it would, you know, not everybody, we don't all have a lot of time and I'm more interested in, um, in uh, picking a few things that we, we can get it, you know, get right on and start doing it rather than I'm, I'm researching, I, I don't think we have to worry about the college, frankly, my, from my kids' experience, recent experiences, that there are loads of things that they're doing. They're very active, and okay. you can speak to Amherst. I think that we should, um, I don't think we should worry about really that. worry about that. Yeah. There, there are um, existing student exchange organizations we, that we could get involved with, like the Experiment in International Living, which I had some involvement with. Um, and I wonder if we could, uh, I, this is probably something everybody could get behind, um, sponsor or partner with a student exchange organization to ensure that every year one person from one of our villages gets to be an exchange student. Maybe we could help out with the person, scholarship. Yeah. And um, maybe Americans going to those places to um, as exchange students, but particularly, I don't know, something like that. And there are organizations already doing this, but not focusing, of course, on the villages that, or the parts of Mexico that we went to. And if we could have input to direct one of the openings, you know, to be always for somebody from Mexico uh, and perhaps raise the, the money to do that, which probably wouldn't be that much split so many ways for one person, you know. Um, I know about Youth for Understanding because we hosted four exchange students over the years. And one of our daughters had come on a scholarship. I don't know how much people coming on YFU have to pay out to come, but it's. I think it's not an, a, an insubstantial amount. I think it's something like seven to $10,000. Seriously? Seriously, yeah. You look at what American students, but doesn't have to be YFU just for the summer payout, and that's several thousand dollars. Well, several thousand. Is, no, that's for a summer experience for yeah. an American student going abroad into a host family. The host families don't get any money, so yeah. all the money goes to the organization. organization. I think there are ways, there might be ways around it, for example, us paying for plane tickets, saving quite a bit of money. Uh, I think it's worth talking to some of these organizations to see if there would be a niche for us to mm -hmm. to sponsor a Mexican student every year. 
I think why that may be you... true if you've got an organization that is sponsoring a lot of students. Then we'd be able to sponsor one. But to sort of find an organization and say, we've got a little thing here we'd like you to do yeah. where it doesn't fall into their mission. I think you'd have a hard time doing it or they'd be charging for disorder. I'd be willing to talk to the experiment and commission for starters because I think there's a possibility there. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I hope we see our dinner drive up momentarily. <laughs> Matt has gone to get it, it and I hope that uh, they will prepare for us. Uh, um, well, it's still lunch left. Oh, yes, it's true. <laughs> um, so a thought about a, sh a short session after dinner, people will stay, which is to make a few decisions about what people would like to volunteer for now in terms of following up in, in, in the way that Marsha's going to take on this, this finding out at least what one organization might do vis-a-vis -vis scholarships. Um, we'll be talking about the trip to Mexico tomorrow, and we have some framework for some questions we could well ask there. And then just go, go back to our list of, of possibilities and see who is interested slash would volunteer. Uh, it, is, is that sort of our, our next step that people see? Um, we've gathered a lot of information and a lot of ideas have come out and this I think have been a very successful day for brainstorming and, and some critique of the idea is also very valuable. Um, I think it might be useful to proceed such a session with a, a, a recasting of, of what we have captured here on the whiteboard and we're lucky to have several very diligent and uh, intelligent note takers. If we could uh, somehow get that, say, well, one, two, three, four, five, basically sums up what we're looking at and then take it from there. Uh, uh, Sounds good. Yeah, yeah so we have, we, have our, we have our, we're generating our list mm -hmm. of, of, and, and it, it basically, I, I think, comes down to someone saying, well, I'll, I'll volunteer to do the next step on that. Uh, but within the context of, of, of what maybe Marsha has raised a couple of times, which is uh, maybe we don't need any inspiration to find uh, uh, things to do. Uh, my sense was we could encourage each other in this and, and be supportive of each other in this for local volunteering and use the website in that way. Uh, and then also, though, identify bigger things that two people to five people to ten people might be interested in following up on. And about half of us who have responded uh, in the last two years are here today. Another half are, are, are not. It could be uh, um, via email and website brought in from into this. Yes, Peggy. Yeah, I have a suggestion about using the website, and that is whenever one of us sends in something to be newly put onto the website, whether it's pictures or a suggestion about a project, mm -hmm. that an email go out to everybody on the email list saying, here's a new link, please look on this. Because yeah. I've been back to the last two years, and I think, mm -hmm. yeah, that was two years with no communication from, or very little from Amherst to Mico. I wonder what was going on. The website. No, I, I, I say yeah. try to maybe do a weekly or a bi-weekly. Oh, the, the, once oh, I no. start getting the, e the, e the emails no, every day from somebody, well, we, uh, 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 we, uh, we haven't had that. We haven't had enough to do a once a month. Oh, no, that's <laughs> just a notification. I, 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 I see your mailbox and if, when I arrive home and see 32 emails, I just go delete, delete, delete. No. Ah, but if I see one that says Amherst Amigos, I would click on it right away. Amigos. I think it's unlikely that it will be daily. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to address this you. from a technical point of view, since it's a problem that I've been hoping to solve for some time, not only for this website, but several others that I uh, manage and design. Um, it can be originally managed That's manually easy. because the volume is relatively low. But if this uh, initiative uh, bears fruit, and I have the sense that it will, there'll be a lot to talk about. 
and therefore the frequency will increase. So um, in terms of the technology for managing <coughs> lots of communication, you can subscribe to a digested version of the communication that might come out once a week. Mm -hmm. So all of the uh, communications there would be listed or you can dive in. Mm -hmm. If you really like the stuff, you can get it as it comes out. Um, one of the concerns that we have um, is actually technical in that to implement a solution like that um, takes more money than our budget, which uh, we might want to talk about tomorrow since we're all, uh, a small number of us are paying out of our own pockets to keep the thing going yeah. to, to begin with. Uh, uh, we could conceivably look at a, a way of automating this process. But I think for now, with the number of people we have that are contributing, uh, we can, uh, and if the frequency of communications increases, we can certainly manage this manually because we have a mailing list uh, that I, I assume reaches all of you. So um, if Peggy slash Woody's comments come in, everybody's going to know about it within half a day if they, if they choose to, or if Peter, uh, Peter and Marcy have news, we hear about that. And I think also, well, just for me, I think the biggest takeaway so far, there are a number of them, but is using this website as a clearinghouse for information and a point of gathering, uniting, digesting, and synthesizing uh, a lot of the ideas that have, have come up here. And I think that's something that can be both done individually and as a collective. So we, we're at a point where we, uh, an inflection point, if you will, where we can really make this thing take off if we decide to. Andy, push the one thing I would say, I think definitely with what you said, is that if it came out less frequently, mm -hmm. I, for one, might be willing to stop and not hit delete, delete. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. I mean, it happens. I'm not even working. Thoroughly agree with that. Yeah. Or we could get a well, Twitter account. I, I, <laughs> once, once, we got the, once we got the website, I, your I thought we would be inundated by comments. And I think there were three comments in the first six or seven months. So so even if we triple our input, <laughs> we're going to get one, one a month. I'll, I'll just say my worst experience was with an idiot on my one committee. And I was this person felt that every time something came in, she had to hit the reply all button. And finally, somebody said, you don't have to hit the reply all button. And the reply came back, reply all. Oh, I thought everybody liked everything I said. <laughs> we were just going nuts. And you come home and there are 50 emails, and you say, well, believe, believe, believe. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, this this is it's not going to happen. <laughs> <It's not laughs> <me guess. laughs> well, um, yeah, why don't we stretch and and, and uh, watch for food to arrive? And there is still coffee. I'm just going to open wine. I'm cocktail just going to leave line. this on the table oh, here. This is the book I put together with Snapfish. Mm -hmm. You're going to visit a lot. Yeah. Oh, thank you all. Let's see. And if I can see your machine.